please state your name, how long you've lived in Carroll County, and political offices you've held or want to hold. My name is Virginia Harrison. I've lived in Carroll County for 37 years, and I uh, am nonpartisan. I, it's the Carroll County Public School Board position that I'm holding. What was your family life like when you were growing up, and how has that impacted you today? My family life uh, growing up was, um, was fun. It's fantastic. My mother was one of 15, and my father was one of five, so we had 20 immediate relatives. And with the marriage, we had cousins, so it was a lot of family intervention. You know, not so much intervention, a lot of family activity. And, and both uh, sides of the family were very humorous, so it was always something fun going on. So, um, you know, and they had uh, great family values because my grandmother, both of my grandmothers were teachers, both of my grandfathers were carpenters, and both of my grandfathers built the schools in the community that we lived, and both of them built a church in the community that we lived. Oh. So it, it was quite interesting. It was always something going on. Big so. dinners and <laughs> summertime. It was just absolutely wonderful. So in other words, you enjoyed attending school because you had really a close connection with that. Well, um, it was a close connection, but uh, we moved to Maryland when I was in third grade. So the first memories I have of uh, beginning school, it was great, but we didn't have any of our relatives that were our teachers. But, and, and at that time, you didn't even realize that your grandparents built the school. As children, we don't think about stuff like that. It's only as we uh, progress through our years that we, it, it makes you look back and think about what, uh, what you went through. And I moved to Maryland when I was, I think when I was eight, we moved to Maryland. Okay. So the, uh what effect did politics have on you as you were growing up? Not much. <laughs> we, back in, in those days, we didn't talk much about politics. We knew who the president was. Mm -hmm. And I remember Eleanor Roosevelt being on television. That was as much as I knew. And the first um, president I think I really knew was Dwight Eisenhower. Okay. And other than that, that was as far as my political uh, experience was and it wasn't until after I got out of high school that um, some friends of mine, uh, people that I knew started to get in politics and I really never thought much about it. I was trying to survive and build my own life and I really never thought that much about it. I, th I think when you're younger, because listening to your response, I can remember uh, Eleanor Roosevelt because my grandmother thought she was just wonderful <laughs> and uh, I remember seeing Dwight Eisenhower on TV mm -hmm. you know because that was just important and that at least that was when I acknowledged you know right. I had recognition of a president right and, and so I remember Eleanor Roosevelt because uh, she was giving a speech one time I don't quite remember what the speech was about but I remember it catching my attention and I was, uh, I was really surprised that it was Eleanor Roosevelt. Because, you know, we think of how we picture things in our mind. It just, I didn't picture, I didn't have that whole picture together. Mm -hmm. Tell me about how you got interested in politics and who were your mentors. I tell you the truth, if someone would have said to me, Virginia, you're going to be in politics, I would be still laying down on the ground laughing now. <laughs> I had no intentions, no desire, nothing. And I tell you what happened, um, I have been chair of the Human Relations Commission for 22, 23 years now. And about four or five years ago, well about six years ago, I was uh, in South Carroll High School and we were walking uh, out of the building and Greg Ecker said to me, Virginia, I heard that you were up for school board. And I was like, what? <laughs> I said, no, that's not true. He said, well, I heard your name being circled around. I said, not me. 
never, I would never do that. I didn't know anything about school board. I'd never been to a school board meeting. I had worked with the school system on a lot of different committees, such as when Paris Glendennan mandated multicultural education for the state of Maryland. I was asked to be on that committee, and I, uh, we worked on the first five-year plan, and I was very impressed with that. And then we did the second five-year plan. And we, I mean, it was amazing, the work that we did. We had to dot every I and cross every T. Mm -hmm. We really worked on it. And the first time I ever met anybody from the school board was when we had to present the first um, mandate to the school board. Okay. And they didn't seem to be real happy with all the work that we had done. But um, that was my first experience with the school board. And um, after that, I was working with the school system in, in the sense of uh, there was an issue at South Carroll and a parent called me and said that his child was not happy with what was going on, but she didn't want her parent to get involved. So he asked if she would mind if he called me and he called me and told me what was going on and could I do any, could I help in any way? And I, I said, well, what do you think I can do to help? And he gave me some suggestions. So I called South Carolina High School and Mr. Booz was principal at the time. And um, I talked to him and told him about the Human Relations Commission and an organization called Carroll Citizens for Racial Equality. And we thought we could come up with ways to uh, solve some of the problems. Okay. So we, uh, Gary and Hahnemann and I went down and we talked to Mr. Booth and out of that came the first leadership conference. Okay. And uh, I found out when you work with the school system, you're constantly asked <laughs> to do something else and do something else. And even with the multicultural um, writing, the first plan for that and the second, out of that came the Multicultural uh, Education Council. And I worked with them for a number of years. And then, um, and as time go on, you meet different people. Because I remember um, we, the first multicultural uh, conference we had, we took 120 kids off site to New Windsor Conference Center. And yes. it, it was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And then when we met after that, CCRE and Human Relations says, that was so good, we need to do it again. We need to continue this. So we decided to put it on next year. And we raised money to um, pay for it. Yes. And we put it on the next year. And then after that, we thought again, we need to do this again because the first year was with just South Carroll. The next year, we did it with all of the high school. Okay. And well, it took us a good little time and a couple blessings from heaven to get the money that we did raise. And so after the second one, we felt we needed to start right away to start raising some money. But after that, right after that, I got a phone call from Brian Locker. And he asked me, he said, Virginia, how serious are you all about these leadership conference? And I said, Dr. Eckers, we are very serious. We think this is very important. I mean, not Dr. Eckers, Brian. I said, we really think this is very important. So he said, I think I have a way of paying for it. And then that year he got a $6,000 raise and he gave it back to the school system with the stipulation that, we, that they pay for the multicultural education um, form. And um, that's how it started. So, you, so till today, you're still having those conferences this many yes, years Yes, the school later. system is still having the conference. And now it's a uh, they uh, it's a like an overnight or Friday to Saturday. I, I mean, it's so exciting because the first time I remember the first one we had, and Gary and I would do the sessions. We did four that day, and at the end of the day, after the fourth session, everybody was gone. We were like, "Dear God, please don't let our kids say about us what some of these kids said," you know, mm -hmm. and and it set the tone for the work that we had to do in the community to bring uh, equality to this county. Well, do you see a difference from way back when you started it till current? Yes, I, I see a big difference. 
I mean, and we have made uh, a lot of progress, but we still have a ways to go. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody was expecting it to happen overnight, but we're still moving forward. And sometimes it seems like it's a snail's pace, mm -hmm. but I figure like, as long as we keep moving, and that's the most important thing, is that we keep moving. But you know, it, with some people, I think if African Americans were Jesus Christ themselves, it wouldn't matter. It just would not matter. I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> I've had that experience but we, myself. But you have to, it's just like having a problem child. You never give up on your child and you just keep working at it and keep working at it. You know, it's a, it's a work in progress. Okay. Work in progress. What were some, what were some of the challenges you faced and how did you overcome them? When? <laughs> in my life? In your lifetime. And, and I guess since you have become more recognized in the community as a leader. You know, um, I was one of three. I had, I had a sister and brother. I was the youngest. And um, my sister and brothers were born when my father was in the service. And I was the only child that was born when my father was present. So my father and I was very close and I have to tell you I was spoiled you know, we were we were we were just very very close and as as things changed in our family and because of the family dynamics yes m my mother was um, it was 15 of them mm -hmm. so you know you couldn't give equally with 15 kids and so you gave to the oldest and then the oldest gave back to the youngest. That works really well when you're 15. But when you have two and they're 16 months apart, it doesn't work really well. So if I ever had a real issue, and my mother was a disciplinarian, you, would, you would not dare talk back to her. And the fact that uh, I was the youngest, I was always thinking, note to self, don't ever do that, what she just did, because you're gonna get it. So. But I could always talk to my dad about anything. So if I had an issue with my mother, then I would go talk to my dad. And he would give me ways of solving the problem okay. and giving me ways to look at it differently. Because, you know, my mother, uh, my parents separated after we moved to Maryland and we lived with my mother. But my father and the whole family was always involved. And even though they were separated, it was all about us. Okay. You know, so if my my mother used to always give my sister everything, and she was waiting until my sister graduated before I was to get back to me. It wasn't working that way, and I felt like I was treated unfairly. But the flip side to that is, when I when I would um, ask my mother for things that she would give my sister, she would always fuss about it. Oh, fuss, 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 and I was so sick of her fussing, you know, and I was like. <laughs> you know what, I'm gonna get these things. This is what I want and this is what I'm gonna get. So I used to do odd jobs. I used to go to the store for people and, and do little things, babysit, and mm -hmm. I would save my money. And I have a girlfriend who lived down the street for, uh, for me. I, her mother had like seven kids and she was a stay home mom. So I would make my money and she had a little bag, brown bag with my name on it. And I would take all my money to her. Okay. Because <laughs> I didn't trust my mother. She may use my money for something else. <laughs> so I would save my money. And because I got tired of my mother yelling at me because I needed stuff. And one day I said, that is it. I'm not doing this anymore. I just felt like it was degrading, yes. you know, that I needed things. And uh, for instance, um, I want a pair of black and white shoes. I said, I want these black and white shoes. I can wear them from church. I can wear them from dress. A pair of saddle about, oxwoods? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and my mother, and she said I could have them. And so we go in the store and get these. I was very happy. And then another issue I had, I always looked a lot younger than I was. Okay. So when I was 13 and I couldn't do it all 13, year old was doing because I looked like I was nine or eight. <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to get these Oxford shoes and my mother's sister went with us. And I had a cousin who was three years younger than me. And she was in fourth grade, 
I was in seventh grade, so I'm in middle school. I'm growing mm -hmm. up. And my aunt started telling my mother, well, you shouldn't get those shoes. You should get the kind that she had gotten from my cousin who was in fourth grade in elementary school. Who was a baby. <laughs> yes. And my mother said, so she had me try them on. And, I, and, and then I realized this lady is not going to buy me these shoes I want. <laughs> so my mother said she was going to buy those shoes. And I was like, this is it, no. And I said to my mother, I said, mom, you can buy the shoes if you want to, but I'm gonna tell you, you're wasting your money. Mm -hmm. And she said, if you don't shut up, I'm gonna slap you. I said, well, you may as well just slap me now. I said, because I'm telling you, you can buy the shoes, that's up to you, but I'm not wearing them. You promised me I could have black and white, and now you're gonna buy these. Mm -hmm. And I said, you can slap me all you want to, but I'm telling you, I'm not wearing the shoes. And I vowed that day I would never, ever ask anybody else for anything. And if I wanted it, it was up to me mm -hmm. to get what I wanted. So I figured if I want something, I have to buy it myself. So my mother told me, well, the next pair of shoes I got, it would be, I'd have to buy it myself. I was like, okay. At least it would be something I wanted. So that's when I learned to take care of what I had. Because we had dress shoes, you know, because we oh, go yeah. to we had church, Sunday shoes always and Sunday school. And play shoes and school <laughs> and shoes. My shoes, Sunday school shoes, wore out. I, I had a huge hole in the bottom of my shoe. <laughs> so I would cut a cardboard and I'd brush them off. They looked like they were brand new, but they didn't have any so I put card on. And when I went to church, it's like, dear God, don't let it rain because I'm going to freeze. <laughs> And my mother never, you know, I never asked her for another thing. And I would put, uh, uh, and I lay my stuff out, you know. And, um, and when I made a little bit of money, if it's something that I wanted, then I would go buy it. So my mother picked up my shoes one day to move it or something, and she saw it was a hole in the bottom. Mm -hmm. And she said, why did you tell me these shoes were uh, worn out? I took my shoe, I said, they're fine. They just need a little more cardboard they will be fine. And she said, you don't get smart with me. I said, look, if I ask you for shoes, you fuss at me. Mm -hmm. And you told me the next pair I needed, I'd have to buy myself. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not gonna ask you for anything you already told me. And I left it like that, because I was like, you better watch out, you know, that was already <laughs> enough. And I was pushing the button. So, uh, so at, um, before that, those shoes that she bought for me, I'm like, I don't have no shoes. I got these ugly shoes, but I had a pair of boots. I put those shoes in a pair of boots. <laughs> they never saw the light of day again until the end of the year. I wore boots to school every day. When I got to school, I had a pair of tennis shoes. I put my tennis shoes on and I, wear, <laughs> I got ready to go home. I'd wear those boots back. And I remember that um, some of my mother's cleaning out the closet and she picked up the shoes and she said, these shoes are brand new and they were really good shoes. Mm -hmm. And then I heard her say, but she said she wasn't gonna wear them. And I said, that's right. And then as a child, I used to play with, uh, I used to love to make clothes with my doll. And I learned to sew mm -hmm. doing that, you know. And when I got to uh, junior high school, they called it, and I had home economics, I was in seven heaven. We had sewing. And I found out it was power in sewing and I could, make anything I wanted to. I, it gave me control yes. over the things that I wanted. I used to um, work in the neighborhood and we had a store downtown, um, Bragger Gutman, okay, and they would have blouses for $1.99. Every week I'd go down there and buy me a blouse for $1.99. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, would, I learned to make skirts and I made skirts. I was in seven heaven. I didn't have to ask anybody for anything. But sometime uh, I, I'd talk to my father about it. And he said, uh, I said, mom wasn't being fair to me. And he said, this is what you do. He said, if you see something you really want and you really need it, just put some money down on it and then I'll help you out. And, you know, and so that's what I did. And, and I never asked my mother ever again for anything. But I learned that she was always smarter than me. So she, <laughs> I would write things Aren't they down. always? <laughs> I'd write things down that I wanted, like for Christmas. And she'd find my notes. And she'd give me a task and give me exactly the money that I wanted. Mm -hmm. And I was like, she's smarter than I am. She figured that out. I got to be better than that. <laughs> 
But the beauty of it was I learned uh, the value of money. Mm -hmm. I really learned how to take care of things because they had, at one time, they had this uh, thing where you could buy the little underwear set and I wanted one they had for dollar nine nine. I bought it. My mother told me it was nothing because she'd always talk about quality. Don't yes. you know buy quality? Just don't buy anything. And she said this is no good. And I promised her. I said it was good. So the little set I had, I used to wash it by hand, every, and it lasted for like six months. <laughs> and then one day she accidentally <laughs> put it in the washing machine and it just fell apart. <laughs> And I was like, so she was right. But at least I had it for six months. But but that uh, determination that you got as a right. child, right. you've built on through your whole life. So that's how you, <clears throat> excuse me, have your sewing business. Right. And you took those same values with you when you right. were appointed to other committees. And now you serve as the president of the Carroll County Board of Education. Right. Because we were always taught when you take from the community, you always give back. And that's how um, I got involved with the Human Relations Commission and all the other things, you know, because uh, the business I had was with the community. So I, I owed the community, so I had to give back to the community. Mm -hmm. And then plus it was great because you have a home-based business and you're working and, and you're stuck, pretty much. You don't get to go out, you don't get to meet people. Yes. But I, I, it was important to me because I wanted to be home for my kids because the kind of job my husband had, he'd leave in the morning, we may not see him for a couple of days. Okay. So I felt like my kids needed to have a stable home and a stable parent. And if they got sick or something at school, I could go. If the school needed some help, I could go. Mm -hmm. I was always available. I yes. had control over that. Yes. So tell me, up about one of your favorite mentors that's in office or has held a public office? I tell you, the reason I am even on the school board is Dr. Ecker. Mm -hmm. When Dr. Ecker became uh, superintendent and I first met him, I met him at a dinner uh, um, for uh, Nancy Grassnick uh, gave out awards and CCRE mm -hmm. got a, a award and uh, it was Nancy Grasnick, uh Minority for Excellence, something like that. Okay. And CCRE got an award and I went to accept it. Mm -hmm. And um, Dr. Chuck was there, so I spoke to him, said hello, he's very polite. And then we had a, a Red Cross breakfast, he sat at my table, I spoke to him, he was very polite. And I was sitting there thinking, I need to know this man, you mm -hmm. know, because I had a great um, relationship with um, Dr. Lockard, Brian Lockard, but I couldn't get close to Dr. Ecker. He'd always speak to me and say hello, and pretty much that. And I was like, I have to find some way to get to know this man. I need him. And so um, one day I was sitting there thinking, how am I going to get to know this man? And my phone rang. I picked up the phone, and somebody said, Virginia, this is Chuck Ecker. I was like, <laughs> Chuck Ecker? I said, hello, how are you? He said, I. Uh, I'd like for you to do something for me. And I'm like, whatever it is, I'll do it. I didn't even care what it was, if you were asking. So, and that's how I really got to know him. And obviously he saw something in me that he thought would fit the school board. And it was because him keep talking to me and telling me was the reason that I uh, got on the school board. Okay. And it was through him. Have you enjoyed your time being on the board of education? Yes, I, I have. I have really enjoyed my time being on the board. Um, it's um, it's challenging. Uh, I've loved all the things that I've learned. I have a great appreciation for the things that uh, the school system does, and just it's, school system is like a city. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just so many parts to it. Mm -hmm. And getting to know that, and because you, it's things that you don't even think about, all the partners they have, all the contracts they have, I mean, all the people working from, it's been amazing. But, and it has been a challenge. It has challenged um, my belief. It has made me stronger. It has let me know that, um, I should be on the school board. I understand why I was asked to be on the school board. And it's time I have questioned whether I, myself whether I should be there. 
because in one sense I thought we were a little further um, ahead than we are in <clears throat> some aspects. Mm -hmm. And it has made me realize that I have total control over what I do and what I say and how it af affects other people. And I hope that makes sense. Yes, it does. You understand what I'm trying mm -hmm. to say? Okay. Uh, do you uh, see the community outreach to you about concerns or thank yous from the school for what's taking place on the Board of Ed? I don't know about the thank you. Uh, it, it amazed me when people come up to me and say, thank you for what you're doing. Mm -hmm. and, and being on the Human Relations Commission, the one thing um, I have learned in life uh, especially when my mother was in her last years, is that um, when you need answers, you need, even if you can't give the answer, you need to give the person another door to go through. Because yes. when I was, my mother was um, in the hospital and she needed services and they would tell me, well, there aren't any more. Somebody would always give me another door to go through. So whenever I get a call from anybody and they, they are looking for me to help, them. I always give them another door to go through. And I was like, here's a number, you call this person. If you don't get the results you need, call me back. Okay. You know, because I like to be accessible because that's what was given to me. Okay. Every time I had an issue, somebody would come to me with an answer. So, and that's what I, I try to do, at least try to make them feel better about what's going on, explain it a little better. Because sometimes uh, with the Human Relations Commission, we would get a lot of complaints, but, um, and, and, and there were small things, just going to the wrong door, mm -hmm. or if they said, well, this person did this and that and the other, and, and I would say, well, well you gotta think about where other people are coming from. So, that's what I try to do. Okay. And what words of advice would you like to pass on to future generations about politics and the importance of serving the community? I think you've kind of already said that. <laughs> well, the, um, the advice I would give you is never forget why you're there. Great. You know, because when, when I uh, realize, I would never say I'm a politician. It was my goal not to be a politician. But I had to have a talk with myself to let, remind myself why I'm here. Mm -hmm. I'm here to serve you. This is not about me, it's, but it's about you. It's about the kids, it's about communication, it's about seeing that our teachers get what they deserve. You know, forget about you know, all this big headedness, because that's just gonna get you in trouble. But just remember who you are and trust in who you are. Because even if you, um, you have to believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. And you can't help anybody until you learn to help yourself. Yeah. I can't help my, you if I can't help myself. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Harrison, for your time today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon. Would you please tell us your name and how long you have been living in Carroll County? Well, my name is Delmar Gillis. I've been in Carroll County over 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, now, let me ask you this. As a teacher integrating Carroll County Public Schools, what was your first school and how long did you teach in Carroll County Public Schools? Well, the first school I taught in Carroll County Public School was Francis Scott Key. Okay. I was there for uh, th 13 years. Okay. And then I got transferred to Liberty High School. Okay. So I was in Carroll County uh, 15 years total. Okay. Um, what position did you have? A vocational agriculture teacher. Really? Now, yes. did you own a farm or something in Carroll County to be um, an agricultural teacher? No, I graduated from Virginia State College in mm -hmm. Petersburg, mm -hmm. and I was working as a teacher in Virginia, mm -hmm. and I heard about the great opportunities in Maryland, so I applied to, to uh, 
Carroll County Public Schools, and mm -hmm. I got the job. What do you think your biggest impact has been in the Car when you were working for Carroll County Public Schools? Well, my biggest impact was, for the was, students. For the students, I believe uh, I taught them a lot about. Uh, the subject, which is agriculture, mostly horticulture and landscape. I wasn't from the farm, so I, I've never been a farmer, but uh, I got into agriculture because of the different skills that an agriculture teacher needed. We had the shop, we had welding, we had wood shop, we had plants, and we did a lot of projects. Uh, and we did that in Carroll County when I was teaching at the schools. And I think the students enjoyed me I also believe because I was a, a black that they appreciated me. That they uh, kind of knew that uh, I was normal. <laughs> I was somebody from outer space, I don't believe. They, 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 I think they enjoyed my classes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What barriers did you encounter, if any, in, while you were teaching in Carroll County Public Schools? Uh, the only barrier was I was just I was black. and. Uh, that was the only barrier I think I have. I, I didn't see any, anything else because uh, I basically wanted to do my job as a teacher. I wanted to make sure my, my students enjoyed my classes. And for the first couple of years I was here, that's all I was fo focusing on. Mm -hmm. I didn't get to know everybody in the school. I didn't know the politics of the school until I, after I stayed there a few years and I started getting around to the other teachers and and uh, being more involved in school activities. Okay. And but I didn't see any problems at all. No problems at all? No. Okay, great. Um, were you ever promoted to administration um, during your tenure in Carroll County Public Schools? Or did you, did, did you have a desire to be an administrator? No, I didn't de desire to be a ministry. I was enjoying my job that I had. I mean, I was okay. having fun teaching agriculture. I had fun teaching the hort running the horticulture program. I got to know a lot of people in the community because they came and, and bought plants from us at, at school. So I, I, was, I was enjoying that. Mm -hmm. Then uh, at one point, the county, wanted, they were looking for administrators. I wasn't really interested. But I said, well, let me go and see what they have to say. Mm -hmm. And at that time, they, they met with teachers after school. So I went up and listened to what they had to say. And basically what they said was they have kind of predicted the future. They're going to need a lot of teachers to, uh, to, to become administrators. Mm -hmm. and I, th I thought about it, uh, but I wouldn't, my desire wasn't to be a, a principal. Mm -hmm. I, I took the class because I was in graduate school, so I took the class of uh, the role of a uh, a role of a principal mm -hmm. that really opened my eyes up to how a school runs and operates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I had no desire to be a, mm -hmm. an administrator. I enjoyed I enjoyed teaching. Oh, great! Um, is there anything else that we you would like to add to your interview that's very interesting and compelling as being the first black um, teacher in Carroll County? Uh, basically, uh, I was told when I was as a, a teacher, I'm, I'm, I'm only minding my own business to try to do my job, and uh, I was told I was the only black teacher on this side of the Chesapeake Bay, and by many, many other teachers in the, in the county or in the state. But uh, as I looked into it, I, was, I think I was our only agriculture teacher that was on this side of the just be big. Gotcha. All the other black agriculture teacher was in on the other side of the bay. In, okay. Uh, Charles County, Wicomico mm -hmm. County, mm -hmm. and those areas. Mm -hmm. But on this side of, of Baltimore, the Western Maryland, I think I was the only black agriculture okay. teacher. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And let me ask you: uh, Did you retire from Carroll County Public Schools? Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, mm -hmm. After I left Liberty High School, I went to. Uh, Maryland uh, State Juvenile Services. Okay, all right. And I, I stayed there about 22 years. Oh, right? okay. Well, again, I probably was the only uh, black horticulture teacher <laughs> working for, for the state. Right. And, 
I enjoyed working at the Charles Hickey School. Mm -hmm. I was there about 15 years. Um, another seven years, I was at uh, Sheltenham Youth Facility. Okay. Well, again, I taught landscape and horticulture. Wonderful. The students really enjoyed the classes, so mm -hmm. Great. I enjoyed teaching. Well, thank you so much for this informative and wonderful interview. Well, you said no matter. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm one of the hills from Tawny Town, and um, I was born July 19th, 1929. Wow. I'm happy that was a good year. <laughs> okay, so you're not leaving any stones uncovered, no, okay? No, so I'm. I'm not. No, I'm not. And um, I am from the family of Daniel and Martha Goings, from my which Goins is my mother's maiden name. She was born and raised in Clear Spring. And my father is a product of James Hill, who married a cook sister. And James' his brother also married a cook sister, so brothers married sisters. And they resided in Tawny Town. We don't know exactly where they came from, but we're in the process now of doing our genealogy. And uh, I do have a lot of information and pictures on them. And uh, we're thinking about doing a DNA test to um, try to figure out how far back they can go with that. And um, we lived in Tawny Town. My father and his brother, Ted Hill, we lived in Tawny Town. And we lived in a double house. So you can imagine what, living in a double house, children running around. and. We lived there until, oh, I don't know how long it was. Well, anyway, Ted moved into the country in his, in my grandfather, great grandfather's home out on, in the other side of Tawny Town. And my father stayed in town, and we moved to my grandfather's property. And coming up as a little girl, I remember hearing some things about my father. I know he served in the First World War. And I don't know exactly what the year was. And I know when he came home, I remember my mother showing me the picture of the ship, the Lusitania, that he came back from the war. And that was, I think, around about 19, uh, maybe 1920, maybe 19, I don't know exactly when it was, but around that time. And so, as he was coming up as a young man, my father's father worked for a family in Tony Town by the name of Bernie. And I'm going to tell you my father's middle name. His name was Clotworthy, and which is a name that you don't hear much of. That came from the Bernie side. And when my father was young coming up, they wanted to take my father and school him to become a doctor. But his father said no, because at that time they wanted their sons to stay home and help them out. So he stayed home, and then um, after that, then he went into the war. But then when he came home, he married my mother. I don't know what year that was. And I don't know how far back I can remember, but my father was sick at a time where he couldn't work. So he was very gifted with his hands and the things that he made. Evidently, I was just an infant because I don't remember him working on these things because he made me like a dollhouse, two-story dollhouse, which I still have, mm -hmm. and it had a white picket fence around it. And the wood that he made the dollhouse out of, he sort of had to resemble brick at the bottom of the house, some kind of way he carved into the wood to make it look like brick. So after that, then he also made me a cradle when I was small. And then he also made a chest of drawers, like four drawers where I could keep my doll clothes in. So I still have all that. And then as I got older, I remember my father running a blacksmith shop. And it wasn't too far from where I live. I must have been about maybe five or six, because I used to remember going down 
sneaking out of the house, going down and watching my father. And I would stand there and ask him questions. I said, now what are you doing now? He says, well, he says, I'm getting to get ready to do some, you know, make some horseshoes to form some horseshoes to put on a horse. So anyway, so one day I was down there and he, this horse was there. So I remember my father having the horse, he was standing in front of the horse and had the horses, no, the horse was, he was standing in back of the horse and then he had the horse's leg between his legs. And I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm cleaning out the horse's hoof. And all this stuff was coming out. I said, why are you doing that? He said, because I have to get it cleaned out so I can put the horseshoe on. So then I said, well, don't, don't that hurt? He says, no, he was pounding. He had the horseshoe on the horse and he was pounding nails. And I said, daddy, don't that hurt? He said, no, that doesn't hurt. So that was one of the things that I remember seeing. And he also used to make rims, you know, like back then they had the wooden wheels with the wooden spokes, but yet they had the metal ring around the, the, the wheel. And he had this kind, he had some kind of a tool with a handle and a round circle on it. That's what he used to measure the distance around the wheel so that he could form the rim to put on that. I mean, there were so many things that he could do. And so then after that, and he got a job, he worked for E.E. E. Stella Contractor with his brother. And to get back to some of my ancestors now, and I'll be bringing that or up uh, about my father later on, but I want to go back to my um, great great grandfather when they had the first family reunion. The first family reunion was held in 1898 because my father must have been about three years old because he was born in 1895. They had it at my great grandfather's house where my uncle Ted lives out, out in um, on the other side of Tawny Town. And after that, off and on they would have gatherings of the family, but then it sort of stopped. And then I think it was around in 1941, I think it was 1941, my mother and my uncle and my aunt got together saying that we need to start having family gatherings again, she said, because we're tired of going to people, relatives who pass. So that's when it started, and there's a place in Tony Town called the Pump House, where the family would get together every first Saturday in July. And down there they had like a stream and all where we could put our feet in and go wading. The guys would go swimming at the other end of it. So we stayed there for a while until around 19... Uh, must have been around 1951. And that's when we moved to the Memorial Park. Now I'm going to tell you how the Memorial Park got started up there. My Uncle Ted and some friends were downtown one night in the restaurant and they had a conversation. One of the guys said, you know what? Says, um, we need to really do something for the town. So one of, the, one of the Klingons, Ed Klingon said, well, you know, they're having a meeting over the fire hall. Let's go over there. So my uncle was there, and Ed Klingon, and I forget the other guy's name. When they got over there, they were into a meeting, and they were talking about, at this meeting, about a park for Tawny Town. So then one of them said, you know what, we need to form a committee. And my uncle was there with them. He says, okay. So they said, well, we have to have somebody to nominate different ones for the committee. So Ed Klingon said, I nominate Ted Hill. So that's how he got on the committee. So then they just talked about what they were going to do. And they said, the first thing we need to do is to lay out the ball field and grandstand. And we need supplies for that. We need wood and all that, but how are we going to get it there? So one of the guys was standing off on the back, and he, was, he said that, okay, if you want it down there, I can get a truck, load it all down there for you. So that's when they got started on the park. And then in the meantime, then other family members, the guys came in to help. My cousin Vincent, he came in to help and laid out the ball field and all like that. And then once it got all that started, 
no pay. They worked in, on weekends and in the evenings because they had other jobs. So that's how they worked on the park. And then the, after they got all that done, then the town said, okay, then they were going to take it over and try to finish it up. The only thing that my uncle got paid for because he was so good at it was like making the fireplace, building the fireplace down there and an incinerator. And then, of course, my uncle, uh, my father's other brother, he donated like the cherry tree. That's how the Memorial Park got started. And now that's why we have our family reunions down there. So it's a real family reunion real for family you then, reunion, going back yes. to your but, um, Coming your up roots. as a child and, and watching my father work, and I was just amazed at the things that he did. And maybe that's where I got my gift from, from my father. And music, because he had a trumpet. My uncle had a trombone. My aunt played the guitar. And I don't know who else was in it. But they used to, on, on weekends, they used to go around the different places in Carroll County and play music. So, I, you know, it's like, and my sister, Leah, the one that you know, knew, was she had a very pretty voice. So that, I mean, she had a lot, lot of music uh, influence in her. Plus I played the piano, I took piano lessons. And my father would play the trumpet with me at the time, you know, when I was playing the piano. He said, okay, he says, don't stop, I'm gonna get my trumpet out. And we just had a grand old time and coming up in 2010 was just, that was great. And then, of course, my schooling in Tony Town was at a Catholic school, and we only had one hour of lessons. And that was in the afternoon after the other kids went home. And my mother was the one person who did not want her children to go without an education. So I, I think she, some kind of way, she must have contacted May Prince. And I remember coming home one day and seeing this strange lady on my front porch talking to my mother. And next thing I knew, we were shoved off to Westminster every day. So we traveled 24 hours every day, 24 miles every day, going and coming from school. To get to Robert to get to Robert in Moulton. Westminster. And we had, and now, oh, and then they said, how are we gonna get those children there? So I guess by my father talking, my mother talking to town, because everybody loved my parents. You know, they called them Mr. Hill and Mrs. Hill and all like that. So Mr. Crabster, who ran the school bus, he said, I tell you what, he said, I will take your children to Mayberry. He said, because that's where I stop when I pick up other children. He said, I'll take them there. Then somebody's got to take them from there to Westminster. And I don't know how this man in Frizzlesburg heard about it, but he offered to pick us up in Mayberry, bring us to Westminster. And then he would pick us up after school, take us back to Mayberry, and Mr. Crabster would pick us up, take us back to Tony Town. So were, did they drive school buses or other vehicles? Or no, Mr. Crabster is the only one that drove the um, school bus. Mr. Cra uh, Mr. Mason, the man in uh, Fiddlesburg, he just had a family and he just heard about it. He had this big car, so he said he, would, he had plenty of room to take us. Yeah. Then after Mr. Mason wasn't able to do it anymore, then Mr. Waller, he said, okay, I will take those kids. He would come all the way to Tony Town and get us. And he lived in Westminster? He lived in Westminster. Okay. And that's how we got our schooling. But your parents sounded like they were very influential then in making sure yes. that you all were yes. getting an education. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, because as you were talking, I'm thinking, okay, one hour of education, what was that like? I mean, did you cover all subjects or just one I subject? I don't know, or? but when we got to Westminster, I started out in second grade. So we were pretty well, I mean, the things that we were taught, I mean, we, it was there for us, so we didn't start in first, the only ones who started in first grade was my youngest sister, my young, two youngest sisters. Uh, it was Bernice, Leon, Marshall, and myself, we started, you know, on, further on in school. So that's how we got our the beginning of education. We couldn't understand why we had to bypass at that time, because we didn't know what was going on. And we had to bypass the high school and the elementary school in Tawny Town to come to Westminster.
Yeah. So it sounds like you didn't even question why you were no, we didn't. bypassing the other schools. No, we you just did knew not. that you were going to school right, in Robert because, Milton in um, Westminster. We had no idea, tell you, we had no idea of what segregation was like. Because all my girlfriends were white girls in Tawny Town. Because my other friends were my relatives, my cousins. And uh, so I had, you know, I was, able, I was able to go all over the town with the girls. You know, my father and mother, we were able to, we always could go to the stores up there. My father belonged to the um, American Legion. My mother belonged to the women's groups. Yeah. So, so it's it, interesting. It's just yeah. like you accepted the yeah, we did. way things were and yeah. you didn't even question. We but, did not question. Yeah, but no, it's interesting didn't. to hear that you still played with the other girls and yeah. you're, you had friends from mm -hmm. certainly yeah. the white race, but you just couldn't go to school right, with them. Right, right. And yeah. I loved to roller skate and this one minister's son, there was a big church on the corner from where we lived and the names was Sutcliffe. I still remember that name to this day and I still remember Paul and his sister Ruth and Paul used to come up every evening and knock on my mother's door and say, can Teresa come out and can we roller skate together? Oh. Sounds like you had a good time doing it, we right? We did, yes, mm -hmm. uh, we did, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yeah. so again, hearing about your, your rich history, all the things that your dad um, was certainly accomplished to do, mm -hmm. sounds like, um, you know, he certainly was a trailblazer in his own right. Yes, he was. Um, and your mom, you mentioned music for your mom, and I'm sure, you know, with the well, child caring and rearing that she did, but uh -huh. did she have any other um, outs? And you mentioned, I guess, some of her auxiliaries or groups that she met with. Well, I remember coming up as a little, my mother every Friday, well, every night before she put us to bed, she would sing us hymns. Mm -hmm. And then she would make sure that we said our prayers. And a lot of little Bible uh, songs she taught us that she would sing to us. And every Saturday night she would, come on, we're going downtown to get our treat. It was ice cream. Yeah. And what she did as we were growing up, my mother took a course, like a health course. And she was able to go out. When the women called her, she would go to the homes. And if they were pregnant, was having a baby, she would help them to birth oh. the baby things like that, or if somebody was sick, they would call on my mother to come and sit with them and do things like that. Yeah. It sounds like you have such a very rich history mm -hmm. um, yeah. of your mom and dad's contributions to life growing yes. up in mm -hmm. Tawny Town. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and certainly you're a product of, of their hard work and their efforts, and mm -hmm. um, I know that you have blazed many trails for yeah. others coming well, along. I so hope talk I about did. your own accomplishments I hope and I did, but some I of the know things you were able to do. The first one in my family to go to college was my middle sister, and then my youngest sister. My middle sister went to Bowie, and my youngest sister went to Morgan. And I remember Mr. Crawford saying to me, Hill, why don't you go to Bowie and be a teacher? That was my last year in, at Marvin Moton. And I said, Mr. Crawford, no, I don't want to be a teacher. That's, I, I don't like teaching. I, don't, I know I wouldn't make a good teacher. So I said, well, that wasn't for me. So uh, as coming up in Tony, I had jobs in Tony Town. I worked for a doctor, you know, going down and up to clean the house and the office and all like that. So that's what I did on up until the time that my mother said, well, I guess she's ready. I can let her go to Baltimore and visit and stay overnight with her cousins and all like that. And so then when I was 22, I think it was, I got married. And from that marriage, we had five children, three, bo three boys and two children, two girls. And I stayed home to raise them. My, my husband worked. And my mother stepped in and says, you're not going to work. You're going to stay home and keep those kids. So you talk about mothers interfering with <laughs> you when you're married, you know, but then, you know. So anyway, so I didn't go to work until my youngest boy went to kindergarten. He was gone half a day. And I had a job that would, didn't know, did I have a job? No. I said, okay, it's time for me to go out now and find something. I went to Cortez Peters and took a business course. That, that got me home when before anybody of the kids came home, even the little one, because I went in the morning. So after I finished there, 
And once Neil was in the first grade, they were all gone all day long. It was a school in my area. I went over there and applied and I got a job as an aide and also an office aide. And then I stayed there until when it was 1970. No, I stopped because I had surgery on my back and I stopped and I wasn't going to go back. So the principal called me one day and he says, um, and that's when Charlotte came in, and that's when he started using my name. He says, Charlotte. I said, yes, Mr. Graybill. He says, come on back. I said, no, I can't come back. He said, no, come on back. And I, under I couldn't understand why he wanted me to come back so bad. So I went back. He says, you're going to stay in the office and work a while. And then next thing I knew, he said, something's coming up and I want you to be in charge of all the aides in the school. Okay, so okay. So then later on, something came through. He says, okay, call some of us in. He says, you wanna to go to Morgan? I thought about it. And then the teachers that I worked under, they said, Charlotte, take it. So I started at Morgan in 1970. Went to summer school, all dawn of winter and fall. And in 1974, I graduated in the top 10% of my class. Wonderful. Magna cum laude with a BS in, in, in education. And I taught on up until 1992 is when I retired. Um, so that was a struggle, but I made it. <laughs> I made it through, yes. Mm -hmm. That was certainly a, a great accomplishment for yes, you. Yes, yes. And my children were behind me. My husband was behind me. And there's only one thing I couldn't do when I was asked if I wanted to accept the Fulbright Scholarship. I knew I couldn't go abroad because of reason to keep the children at home, you know, even though they were growing. But yet my youngest one was graduating the same year I graduated from Morgan, but yet he st I knew he still needed me. So that's why I had to decline. So you put your family first. Yes. Uh, but did. certainly mm -hmm. um, continued your career in teaching. Yes. Did you teach um, where you lived then, or did you go to another area to teach? I or? taught in Baltimore City. So you stayed in Baltimore I City stayed your in whole Baltimore career? I Baltimore City, and I traveled for the first few years. And then the principal called me in his office. He says, we're going to have to let you go. I said, why? He said, because you're going to another school. I said, well, I like being, you know, what I'm doing, I like going circling. He says, no, he says, when another principal at a school asks for a certain art teacher, you better go. And I remember the principal's name, Anne France, one of me at Mount Royal Middle and Elementary, Elementary Middle School. And that's where I stayed until 19... 92, from 82 to 92 is where, that's where I stayed. Well, very good, mm -hmm. very good. It sounds yeah. like, again, you had a, a, it was a, a good career yes, I in did. teaching. I mean, yes, I did. And, you know, I just feel that um, God put me in that path. He knew what, was, what I was supposed to do. I didn't, but, you know, and I told Mr. Crawford I never wanted to teach. Yeah, yes, I remember you had said that earlier, yes. and then that's how you, you know, really ended your yes, career as yes. a teacher. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so that's, um, again, just um, very, very interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really, and then, of course, then I retired, like I said, I retired in 92, and I did that because my daughter had just, she, has, she was teaching, and then she had a little one. Yeah. I said, no, I want to come home and keep that baby so that she can have a free mind and knowing that her mother's keeping the baby for her. And I kept him and would take him to school or she would drop him off. And when he started the school, I would go pick him up, bring him home, she would pick him up. I did that for that little rascal on up until he was even in senior high school because <laughs> they lived out in Cockeysville. And I lived in the city and she taught yeah, on the on uh, in Essex. I see. Yeah. So I'm sure she really appreciated yeah. that. Uh -huh. So you know, as you're talking again, not only um, am I thinking of certainly your career in education, but um, hearing how you know you really didn't start 
until later on in life. I know, so that yeah. too makes you a trailblazer. I mean, because you know, you could have just said, okay, at this time in my life, I'm just going to, you yeah, know, stay yeah. where I am and, you yeah. know, maybe keep working in the office job and, mm -hmm. um, you know, other jobs that right. are available. This, uh, but, yeah. yeah, you went and back another, and got an education yeah. and became really certified. And another to thing, teach. my children will bring it up once in a while. They said, Mom, we're so proud of you. Mm -hmm. And my youngest son said here a couple of Sundays ago, he was at my other son's church and he, was talking, he looked at me, he says, Mom, he says, you know what? He said, you stayed home and took care of us. And my oldest, my second son said to me one day, he says, you know, he says, you planted a foundation, I gave, had us, you planted a good foundation for us, you know. He says, I left church, but I'm back. He said, that's what that did, that's what you did for me. And that's really priceless when yes. our kids can come yeah. back and yeah. um, certainly and, I mean, us. tears came out, you know, mm -hmm. I started crying and all uh -oh. that, so we give myself together. <laughs> yeah. Well, mm -hmm. as I'm reflecting again on our conversation thus far, I mean, I've certainly heard of the Hill family. I've known the Hills. I'm from Tawny Town. Uh -huh. And um, again, you've just opened up a, a, a whole other um, perspective as far as the, the contributions um, made by your father and yeah. your mom and yeah, they did. Um, they, uh, you and your relatives. You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, they taught us how to respect one another and, you know, and um, but not to lay down and take anything, you know, but just to be strong. Yeah. So that's what we did. So. Okay. So some closing comments from you concerning being a, a, a trailblazer. I mean... Um, any final thoughts that you would like to share? Um, I think by having two daughters, by them seeing their mother and the way their mother has presented herself, I think that's helped them to be the kind of women that they are today. And I even, to this day when I see students I don't remember them, but they know me, and we talk. They stop and say to me, Mrs. Franklin, I'm so glad that you had us. He, she says, they would say, you were tough on us, but it paid off. I mean, these are full-grown men and women that would come to me and say that. I said, yes, I said, because you know, Mrs. Franklin didn't play in the classroom. Yeah. And to know that I, I, mean, I know that I have, and my, just like my son says, Mom, you have touched thousands of lives. He said, you may not know it, but you have touched thousands of lives. And I feel that I have done some good for the, the younger generation, you know. So and you should certainly feel confident that yeah, certainly yeah, you've yeah, done yeah. a lot. And I know there are others who certainly look up to you and hope to that you know, emulate mm -hmm, um, some of the yeah. fine qualities that you possess. So thank you so very much for sharing um, with oh, me today concerning thank you your for family. Thank you for asking me to come. You're quite welcome.